But if you're not familiar with who we are at Habitat Hero, we empower engagement through a variety of platforms. It's mainly an educational program. We do a lot of in-person and now online events as well. Each year we host between 70 and 75 events reaching about 3,000 people. Last year we fit right in that about 74 events and just a little over 3,000 people. We also have our backyard certification program. We'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. Here's a garden in uh, Fort Collins. You can see the all weather garden sign displaying uh, a gold certification. We also have a robust uh, volunteer network. Volunteers are really essential to come out and help maintain our demonstration gardens. We have about 15 in uh, Larimer and Weld counties. And so we, we do rely heavily on volunteers to come out for weeding events or maintenance events, add more plants, et cetera. Uh, volunteers have also been featured on their garden tours or tabling events. There's lots of ways uh, to get engaged in the community. So if you're interested in volunteering, uh, we're going to be sending out our presentation at the end of this and I, I can include some more um, information in my contact info as well if you're interested in volunteering. We also have a resource library that just got updated and it has a five-step program on how to create and certify your Habitat Hero Garden. It starts you off with some articles on why we look at planting native plants for our birds and our pollinators. Then it talks you through a native plant uh, database searchable via your zip code. You can export those native plants to your email. Then step three is the design or planting efforts and we have some pre-planned garden designs. Uh, step four, after you started planting your garden and you're ready to certify it, we go through the steps on that. And then the fifth part of the process is ongoing engagement. So community science projects, volunteer opportunities, some children's resources to get kiddos outside in the yard as well. So I highly encourage you to check out our online resource library as well. And again, that link will be in the follow-up email for you as well. Uh, social media, we have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This is where we post a lot of our upcoming news, upcoming events, uh, blogs, articles, and we have really ramped that up these past few weeks as well. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, as mentioned, we have demonstration gardens throughout Colorado and Wyoming and Utah. 15 of them are in Larimer and Weld counties. A lot of them do have interpretive signage. Uh, we will be having that on our website soon with a self-guided public driving tour of these 15 gardens in Northern Colorado. So stay tuned on that. So we're gonna focus a lot of our presentation tonight on the importance of native plants. This just gives a nice recap of, and a roadmap of where we're going on our conversations with native plants. They're really great for our birds. 96% of our terrestrial birds feed their young insects, and we really need a foundation of native plants to support insect diversity. Again, we'll talk about some studies that highlight this. Better for our people. This is a great way to connect with nature, especially now. This is a wonderful time we can uh, still have those intrinsic and extrinsic benefits for enjoying time out in nature. Uh, we just went up to Horsetooth Reservoir last weekend and it took us about 30 minutes to find a parking slot because all the parking lots are full right now. So gardening is a great opportunity, especially right now in light of what's going on, to just go outside and connect with nature in a safe way as well. Uh, better for our planet, you know, our habitat provided by native plants can help birds adapt and survive amid a changing climate. Uh, native plants really help increase their resiliency as well by giving them food and places to rest and nest. Our changing climate is already affecting many species of birds. I encourage you to check out Audubon's uh, Survival by Degrees Climate Report that was released back in October of 2019. It was Climate Report 2.0 and it states that over two-thirds of North American birds are at risk for extinction due to climate change and planting native plants is a great way to give them what they need. Planting native plants is great for our watershed. The EPA estimates that 30 to 60 percent of our fresh water in uh, our American cities is used for, you guessed it, watering our lawns. 
So this is an opportunity to kind of shift that paradigm and conserve our water and have that be for a watershed. Also helps with our watershed value. Plants do a really nice job of filtering any chemicals. <laughs> hi there, that's my husband doing laundry. Say hi. Um, but plants do a really nice job of filtering that before the runoff comes down, hits our sidewalks and our pavement and just runs into our sewers, has a chance to get filtered first. Uh, reduction in our chemical use as well. We have some reports that state that there's 80 million pounds of pesticides that we use here in the United States alone for just our turf grass lawns. Um, and what's more is as homeowners, we're not as regulated by what we're putting onto our landscapes, say a farmer uh, is more regulated. Uh, so there's some reports that say that we use 10 times more pesticides per acre than the farmers use on crops on our turf grass. Planting with natives can help with our reduction in maintenance. You know, Colorado is a tough place to grow plants. And so let's make it easy on ourselves and plant plants that can survive our extreme temperature swings and scant precipitation. And then, then that helps us not going to the nursery every year and adding to more and more plants that didn't make it. But trust me, there's still maintenance involved. You'll be out there weeding too. <laughs> and you can certainly have a beautiful landscape with our native plants. That's just an arrange, uh, your landscape design is just the arrangement of your plant palette. And you can still have a very formal design with native plants so it doesn't have to be a messy uh, landscape by any means. So we'll just zoom out for a second. And this is how Audubon looks at our um, birds and conservation of birds throughout the flyways. As a whole, we look at landscape scale conservation through the lens of birds. And birds face many challenges throughout their lifetime. One of those is our, uh, during that time of migration. And your yard can really act as an oasis for them to be able to provide them what they need, the food and shelter and a place to rear their young. So what we'll look at is a population density map to really highlight why the Habitat Hero program focuses on our urban and suburban cities for habitat restoration. So here is the year, let me get my little highlighter up. Let's see, I'll do my laser pointer. Here's the year of 1940. And we're gonna jump up through the decades with a projected look of housing density in 2030. And we're going to focus on areas that have this red or orange look to it here on the front range. Oops. My mouse is being funny. Here we go. I promise I know where the front range is. My laser pointer is not cooperating. But we'll focus on those high housing density units that are indicated by the red or orange. We'll just kind of jump through it as a uh, kind of a comic strip. I'll go nice and slow to make sure your Wi-Fi connection can keep up with the change of the slides. You can start to see the uh, urban sprawl take place. 1980. And then here's a projected look at the front range. Uh, 2030 from now. So during that time frame, we've lost about 150 million acres of ecologically productive land to what we like to call the suburban urban matrix which is about 42% of that landscape conversion looking something quite like this. We'll mention Douglas Tallamy later on in some of his research, uh, but I highly encourage you to read his book, Bringing Nature Home. He's an entomologist and professor out of the University of Delaware, Douglas Tallamy. And in that book, he states that over 40,000 square miles of pavement, sorry, pavement, and over 60,000 square miles of turf grass here in the lower 48 states. So this program, again, really highlights our opportunity to make a difference and really change this style of landscape and uh, create living landscapes that's rich and full of life, uh, full of native plants and really benefits our birds and our pollinators. 
So what is a habitat here garden? We focused a little bit of our conversation on native plants, kind of setting the stage on that. And trying to think of having a diversity of native plants with a variety of colors and textures and bloom times. Again, we'll, we'll focus some of our conversation on that here in a minute. Arranging it so you have your canopy, your midstory, and your understory, so creating that diverse habitat structure, creating those different niches that birds and pollinators rely on. Having a water source, this could be something very simple. We'll talk about um, some very easy ways to include a water source, which is essential for drinking and bathing. And it's a great way to bring in some uh, butterflies to your garden as well. Uh, the removal of invasive plants, that can be done in a twofold fashion. It can be going out into your yard and removing invasive plants. Uh, well, you especially want to remove your invasive plants, but you can also start to remove some of your non-native plants that have the potential to escape our gardens, degrade your own habitat and escape and degrade our, the landscape as well. And it can also be next time you go to the nursery to opt for a native plant instead of including more non-native plants and uh, perpetuating that cycle of introducing more of those non-native plants into our landscape. Reduction of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. As you start to use those native plants, you'll start to see how they've adapted with our native insects and you'll really start to rely less on those chemical uh, fertilizers and pesticides. And especially turf grass is a hard plant to grow. Uh, it's very water thirsty and does rely quite a bit on pesticides to make it that lush green look. So as you start to cut back on your turf and add more native plants, you'll just start to see the need um, of your chemical fertilizers and pesticides go down. Uh, elimination of hazards. As you're creating the safe space for feathered friends to come and enjoy, you do wanna make it safe and keep your cats inside or put reflectives on your windows, be strategic on where you place your bird feeders or bird boxes near your um, home to keep everyone safe. And then there's other things that you can do to your landscape that have nothing to do with plants. And we'll talk about incorporating snags and pollinator houses and bird boxes and leaf litter and brush piles. There's a whole array of things that you can add to your landscape beyond just adding plants. And then these last two components are really nice. This is what you get out of your landscape instead of what you're necessarily putting into your landscape. This is a chance for you to be a scientist Go outside in your yard, again, connect with nature and use your yard as a living laboratory and collect data for a very, there's a variety of conservation programs out there collecting data on birds and pollinators. Some of them that you might be familiar with is Great Backyard Bird Count or Christmas Bird Count. Both of those are really long standing community science projects through Audubon. So if you're interested in more community science projects that either Audubon has to offer or other conservation organizations, I will include that in that follow-up link as well because it's a great way for us to get involved and also kiddos and grandkiddos to go outside and flip over rocks and collect bugs and see what's out there and to document it. Uh, it's a way to use technology too in a positive way using say iNaturalist apps and collecting data what's out in your yard. And the volunteer component, we touched on that earlier as well. There's lots of ways to give back. It can be as simple as just talking to your neighbors and this is a great time to do that as you're outside. There's a lot of people <laughs> doing house projects, cleaning of garages I've seen, painting furniture. Uh, so when you're outside in your garden, as a passerby is walking by, you can talk to them about what it means to be a Habitat Hero. So these again are the components of a Habitat Hero garden. We're gonna talk about them in more details, uh, but this is just kind of a nice roadmap to see what those components look like. So switching gears just a little bit, This was the past criteria for choosing or selecting plants for our landscapes. And this really relies on the professional industry. So as landscape designers, you know, the main thing that we were really looking at is, you know, what plant is the right plant, right plant for the right place? Did it grow? And was it pretty? Check the box. You know, got the right soil, light, water requirements, looks good, voila. Whereas we can really start to see what we can get back from our landscape. These are called ecosystem services that our native plants provide. And this should really be the future criteria for selecting or choosing plants for our landscape. 
We're going to talk quite a bit on the food web value here in a moment. The wildlife appreciation, you're going to see an abundance of birds and pollinators in your yard. This is again a chance to connect with nature, having that mental health component. Uh, weather moderation, we can be really strategic in wind breaks, um, fire mitigation strategies. Uh, we talked about the watershed value, having plants giving having plants giving the opportunity to filter our water first before it just runs down into our streams. Soil restoration and carbon sequestration. You know, annual plants, one, they're costly because you have to replace them every year. Uh, I'm specifically thinking of like those hanging baskets, say at Home Depot. And they don't sequester carbon as well because when they perish at the end of the season, they release their carbon. Whereas our perennials will store the carbon in their tissues year after year until, until they perish themselves. So plants provide food for birds by giving them uh, larval host plants, so offering them insects, berries, and nectar, and seeds, and nuts. Kind of like the equivalent, I like to think of this as going out and going into your pantry and getting a quick snack versus having a really complete meal that's balanced with your macro and micro uh, nutrients. There's certainly nothing wrong with having bird feeders. We have bird feeders at our place. It's a great way to bring some of our more common birds to our backyard. Uh, but bird feeders can pose some issues, um, especially if you're closer to the foothills or the mountains, you have to worry about bears and uh, worry bear, uh, put in some strategies for bear safety. Uh, it's expensive, especially high quality seed that you want to use so you don't have a bunch of plants popping up underneath, specifically sunflowers. And you don't get a great abundance of birds. We tend to hear, oh, all well, I get are grackles, uh, doves, and squirrels. <laughs> I want the pretty flashy songbirds. How do I get those? And plants do a really nice job of bringing in those smaller songbirds that don't get outcompeted at the feeder. They've also co-evolved with our plants and can seek them out with visual or chemical cues as well. And the plants provide a complete meal for the birds. Uh, here we have a house finch in the tree. Uh, but for example, they might be plucking off a berry that's full of sugars and carbs. Uh, but they might also be getting a aphid or insect full of protein uh, and maybe even some pollen at the same time, which is full of fat. So then you have all your food groups, your macro micronutrients uh, fulfilled in uh, off your plant versus say a pulled sunflower seed from your bird feeder. And insects really do tell the most compelling story on how and why native plants matter. This is where we'll get into Douglas Tallamy's uh, research for a little bit. Uh, but we all have heard in the news, right, the monarch and the milkweed. But guess what? They, this uh, relationship is not the anomaly. It is the norm. 90% of our herbivorous insects can only eat the plants or plant lineage that they've co-evolved with. They've over time adapted uh, chemical cues or um, metabolic uh, enzymes to digest the plant matter. And it's the equivalent of us one day being like, you know what, all I'm going to eat is pine cones. <laughs> you know, it takes a long time to really be able to eat a certain lineage. So we want to uh, incorporate native plants into our landscape because a landscape full of non-native plants, for the most part, is very unpalatable for our insects. You know who it's going to draw in are the 10% uh, your generalist feeders who we often think of as pests. Those are the insects that can really eat anything and they will, and they don't often have a predator um, for checks and balance uh, put in place. And a world without insects really is a world with fewer um, critters out there, a world with less biological diversity. And also it would reduce our, uh, our food palette, our choices of food. One in every three bites of food that we take come from our insect pollinators. So without them or with fewer of them, we wouldn't have all those healthy fruits and veggies and we'd be eating more processed foods. And here's an example to show you why we need native plants and how they do support that insect uh, diversity and abundance. So this is Douglas Tallamy's research I, I mentioned earlier. What they did was look at, get my laser pointer up again. They looked at a native oak and in contrast to a non-native, uh, this is a common ginkgo. 
And what they did was they actually used a leaf blower. They reversed the mechanism on it to suck the material off the tree, the organic matter versus blowing it. And they sifted through to count and identify caterpillar species. Uh, specifically caterpillars, they're great baby bird food, they're soft body, they're full of protein. Uh, they are easily shoved down the throats of baby birds that don't have teeth so they can swallow them versus um, you know, a crunchy exoskeleton is a little bit harder to do. And as mentioned earlier, 96% of our terrestrial birds do feed their young insects. So even birds that we often think of exclusively feeding on nectar, say hum hummingbirds, they do feed their young um, aphids and caterpillars. So getting back to the study, what they, what they noticed when they uh, sifted through the organic matter was over 537 species of caterpillar were on the native oak in contrast to only four species of caterpillar on the non-native ginkgo. So if you are a bird in search of food, especially for your young, you could see what a life-threatening difference that is, yeah? The poster child of the study was actually uh, of a mountain chickadee. I know this is a picture of American kestrel, but the poster child was a uh, mountain chickadee in 1961. It was a study done by Brewer. And they wanted to see, well, how many caterpillars does it take to rear a family of chickadees? So they counted around the clock, mom and dad bringing back caterpillars to the nest. It takes about 14 to 16 days for those baby birds to fledge or leave the nest. And in that time frame, mom and dad were bringing back between 390 and 570 caterpillars in one day. So in that time frame, 14 to 16 days, you can see somewhere between six and 9,000 caterpillars are needed to rear just one family of chickadees. And you could extrapolate that example of, you know, if you want birds of substantially larger size, like here we have the American kestrel, or more chickadee families in your neighborhood, you're, so, you're certainly going to need to provide an abundance of native plants to support that insect life. So what I'll do in our follow-up material is provide some handouts for you that really highlight the best plants for birds. And Audubon just released um, kind of 2.0, their native plant database. It's searchable by zip code and you can then filter out if you want shrubs or trees or perennials. And you can even filter out what um, bird families that you're interested in having. Uh, but we'll talk about a few of the plants on each of these pages. And remember that seesaw image that we showed earlier, when we're looking at selecting plants for our landscape, we want to have a decorative value and the, the food web value support that they offer. And you also want to enjoy it too. So I kind of think of those three components. Um, so for example, with the sand cherry, it's super easy to grow. It can get overwatered and sucker out. So I encourage you not to overwater it, uh, but it provides essential habitat. It creates that nice thicket. Uh, there's berries for the birds. Uh, it's a great larval host plant for the birds. Uh, it creates that nice shelter. It's a great nesting site for birds. And um, one of my favorite things about it is it's blooming first thing of the year, usually right after that first frost. So we can see it bloom as early as mid to late April and it's super sweet and fragrant and it hits on all of those components. Great for birds and wildlife, it's easy for us to grow, and it's a native plant that does a really nice job of enhancing our landscape. Here we go, here are some birds that you might attract to your yard as you start to incorporate more native plants, especially plants uh, that are your larval host plants. Here we have a downy woodpecker. Here we have, uh, what do we have here? I can't even see, I, my little thing is so small. House finch, <laughs> sorry. A uh, barn swallow. Here we have uh, western kingbirds, common grackles, and we also have song sparrows. So my photos are sm small on the presenter view. That was tough bird identification there. <laughs> uh, berries. We want to be able to offer flash and persistent fruit. So the difference between those, you know, a flash fruit is something that's soft and fleshy and ready to be eaten right then. Uh, think of an apple. 
In contrast to a persistent fruit, uh, hawthorn is a great example of a persistent fruit. It undergoes a series of thawing and freezing and thawing and freezing until in the winter time, it's soft and fleshy and ready to be eaten. It persists, persists through the winter time. And those are two really good times to provide food for birds or berries for birds. Late fall, as they gear up for migration, the carbo load, and then also in the winter when food resources are most scarce. You cannot go wrong with a three leaf sumac. It's a USDA hardy zone three. It's very fragrant. You get a lot of bang for your buck, especially with horizontal spread. It's perfect fence height. It's about six feet tall and it gets about 10 feet wide. Uh, creates great habitat. And then also the berries are ideal for the birds. It's very easy to grow. It's uh, water and um, water tolerant and also uh, wind tolerant. Choke cherry. This is fabulous if you do live in a more uh, moist area of your yard or a riparian area, but it does provide a nice shade for you all uh, and jam or uh, cherries to make lovely jam for you all. You'll be out competing the cherries from the birds. And it's great for our tree cavity nesters. It's a great larval host plant and a lot of the birds um, will enjoy perching in it as well. So who can we expect to see as we start to have our, um, bearing, our fruit bearing shrubs out there? And another thing to point out, I see a lot of times people put out uh, fruit trays, specifically oranges uh, cut in half. And it is a great way to bring in say bullocks, orioles, or even robins to your yard. Uh, but again, if you live in the mountains or the foothills, you have to worry about bears. And also they bring in a lot of bugs it's expensive to be putting out fresh fruit. So as, as you offer fruit um, from your plants, it's a nice way to bring in a, a diversity of birds in a less messy way too. How about here we have a cedar waxwing. We also have bohemian waxwings here. Here's a picture of a bullox oriole. Uh, orchard orioles are somewhat common around here and we're even starting to see Baltimore orioles. Uh, we I positively identified one at a bio blitz back in 2018 up in Wyoming, outside of Cheyenne. Uh, and now we're starting to see them here in the Front Range as well. They've been positively identified also at the gardens on Spring Creek. So you might, you might see a Baltimore Oriole, although they are extremely rare. Uh, here we have a Townsend Solitaire. Here's a Swainson Thrush on a red elderberry. Here's a Black-Headed Grosbeak uh, and American Crow. These are some birds that would really enjoy having uh, some berries in your yard. Nectar, this is your high octane fuel. This is the category where we think of more than just uh, the birds and the bees, but wasps and butterflies and beetles and dragonflies, you name it. And this is a great category to really start to look at how to incorporate plants that bloom early in the season, all the way till that first frost of the season. Uh, you can't go wrong with your penstemons. There's over 250 in the genre. They're very water tolerant. They're great for your prairie garden. They offer a nice pop of color and they vary from being a great ground, ground cover to several feet tall. One of my favorite actually, everyone does the Rocky Mountain penstemon. It doesn't bloom very long. It usually just blooms a couple of weeks around the 4th of July. Uh, but one of my favorites this year is the largemouth. Uh, Beard tongue, it's in the Pinston and Pamela or genre. And it is a showstopper. It got to about three feet tall last year, big uh, tubular blooms, and it bloomed for almost a full month. So it's fun to incorporate a variety of Pinston since they do have different bloom times and some shorter than others. Uh, milkweed, the clay orange uh, and the showy milkweed do really well here on the front range. Uh, this is a great plant to plant in abundance. So you get a nice hedge, a nice pop of color. So looking at planting more uh, numbers of plants versus the um, uh, plant species themselves. So you get more bang for your buck, say if you planted nine milkweed plant and nine penstemons versus you know six different species of plants in quantities of only three. It's also a nice visual for us, and you'll draw in your pollinators as they start to see these large patches. 
some pollinators can seek out these patches up to a mile away. So it's really nice to offer those big hedges. Uh, rabbit brush, it's a great late season blooming plant. It's a butterfly magnet. You'll start to see them as uh, land on those big uh, clusters, those landing pads, if you will. And I highly encourage you to use those and start to mimic our natural surrounding landscape, which has a lot of rabbit brush here on the front range. Here is all the fun pictures of our pollinators. Nuts and seeds, this is a great winter source of protein, especially when our food resources are very scarce. Being here on the front range, especially east of I-25, we want to mimic our natural surrounding landscape and really mix and match and play with different grasses. Not only do they offer great uh, visual and textural interest uh, throughout the year, uh, it's a great way to offer food resources in the winter. So you don't need to worry about cutting back your grasses in the fall. In fact, leave them there. The birds will thank you and the overwintering insects will thank you. Oftentimes they'll overwinter in the stems of the grasses as well. Uh, and then you can do your spring cleanup and cut them back then, but you don't wanna regularly mow them and you don't want to uh, cut them back in the fall. Uh, big blue stem is a fabulous grass. Uh, it gets to about six feet tall and it turns a nice kind of red or russet color in the fall. Uh, wheat colored in the winter, it's beautiful when the snow collects on it and it's really fun to see some goldfinches playing around collecting the seeds out of it. Uh, earlier I mentioned 96 percent of our terrestrial birds feed their young insects exclusively. This little guy right here, the American goldfinch, your fun fact of the day, he's in the anomaly category. He does feed his young, he and she feed their young uh, nuts and seeds. So they are an anomaly. Uh, coneflowers, here you see the American goldfinch on the purple coneflower. Great for your prairie garden, nice pop of color. They get to about two, three feet tall. And it's, you can find some great native varieties in our nurseries as well too. We talked about the hawthorn earlier being a great one for your persistent fruits, and they also offer great nuts and seeds. So who can you expect to see coming to your landscape? Dark-eyed juncos and black-capped chickadees, American goldfinch, your white-crowned sparrow, your pine grosbeak, and your American robins. We'll all thank you for leaving out some nuts and seeds in the wintertime. And this picture really highlights how you can arrange it so you do have your canopy and your mid-story, your understory and your ground cover as well. As you start to offer those different niches, you'll be able to offer more habitat for different birds and pollinators. And remember, there's lots of things that you can do to add to your landscape that don't mean putting, on, putting in plants in the ground. Here's an example of a water feature. Uh, water features do a really nice job of bringing in your birds, especially if it's uh, running water. Uh, but it doesn't need to be an elaborate koi pond or anything like that. In fact, you might get uh, in the weeds, <laughs> unless uh, in the weeds, so to speak, because uh, ponds can be such expensive upkeep. And unless you have a real knack for water ecology, they can be hard to to maintain. So I encourage the route of simple water sources. So bird baths, um, flipping over cake pan lids and filling it up with some sand and gravel and larger rocks for perching areas and just filling it with a couple of inches of water. You'll start to see a lot of butterflies cuddling in uh, your water baths as well, or your bird baths. Uh, you can also hollow out tree stumps and let water naturally collect there. You can also divert stream channels in your yard and let uh, water flow naturally to a part of your yard downhill and put some plants that require a little bit more moisture at the bottom. Let gravity be your friend, let it do its work for you. Shelter and nest sites, evergreens are really nice at keeping our birds safe during weather, uh, inclement weather and also from predators. Here's an example of a brush pile. Some HOAs don't let you have a brush pile in the front yard. So this might be something that you incorporate in your backyard or you know, in a 
part of your landscape that's not highly visible, but it's a great way to bring in birds and other critters as well. Your juncos, uh, tohis, wrens, sparrows, they'll all be foraging around in leaf litter too. So you could put leaf litter on the bottom and then the brush pile on top. And you just leave some holes or openings so the birds can flit in and out as well. And you can vary the structure of um, stability and have some of those larger branches on the outside to keep it upright. Uh, leaving up snags, this doesn't mean you have to have a looming cottonwood tree that looks like it's going to fall on your house or your neighbor's house or a power line. It could be just fallen logs uh, on your landscape or leaving some dead twigs even on the ground. Uh, or if it's a snag uh, that's safe, doesn't look like it's looming on anything, a lot of birds will enjoy that for perching or tree cavity nesters as well. Uh, bird and pollinator houses, this is a fun way to see who you can attract in your yard. I will tell you the trick is to make it rustic. When you start to um, paint them and make them too cutesy, some of the ones that you get at um, nursery centers, birds often don't um, seek shelter in those. Those are too flashy. So if you can just get rustic wood that's untreated, uh, no scent to it, so like cedar wood wouldn't be a very good option for bringing in birds. Uh, those are the ones that you're going to have your nesting birds in. And there's kind of two options you can do for do-it-yourself projects. You could either uh, do it from scratch, get some reclaimed wood, and I encourage you to go to Cornell Labs um, ornithology website. They have the right house for the right bird, and they'll give you the three main things that a birdhouse needs to have to attract the right bird. And that's the hole size, uh, height off the ground, and where to place it in your landscape. Or they have kits out there that have all of those compiled together with instructions. And that's Birdhouse Depot, a fabulous resource for kits. Uh, they take about 30 minutes to assemble. We do those a lot for youth programming as well. So I encourage you to do that if you're looking for a fun do-it-yourself project right now. You can order it online and uh, hammer the screws in and voila, you'll get a birdhouse up. So I encourage you to stay involved with us. You know, I wish I could stay all evening with you all while you enjoy your dinner and drink your wine, talk about gardening for days. Uh, but I know you're interested in uh, answering some, having me answer some of your questions tonight. Uh, but we encourage you to get involved with the program. Uh, again, we have a lot of different events. We're being very creative during this time. Uh, doing a lot of online events. Right now, every Thursday at noon, we are doing a lunch hour webinar with a guest presenter. We've had two so far and we have the rest lined up through the end of June, so hopefully you'll join us tomorrow at noon. Uh, we have our wonderful resource library as well. We hope you certify your garden. We're here for every step of the way. If you have questions, we'd be more than happy to help you. And then again, the, the volunteer component as well. So I'll open it up at this time for Q&A for the next 15, 20 minutes. And I believe Jen will moderate the questions and then I will answer them. So I'll let her jump on and kind of explain that process. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer. I work with the City of Greeley and Water Conservation. Super excited for this presentation with Jamie. Feel free to ask any of your questions down below. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there will be a chat box and a Q&A box. Um, ideally, you would put your questions in the Q&A box, but I'll be reading from the chat box as well. So feel free to send in your questions now. I see a few coming in, so we'll kind of just jump into it. Um, we have a question from Stacy. She asks, do you have any specific tips for urban neighborhoods? I'm in Denver, already have lots of native plants, and I can't wait to add some of these other elements. Hi, Stacy. Thanks for joining us tonight. I have a perfect answer for you. Tomorrow at noon, our webinar is going to be a success story for, from Cherry Creek HOA 3, which is located in Denver. And the HOA president will be joining us and talking about what water conservation methods and measures that they put in place in their HOA. And his name is Don Ireland. He's a wonderful ambassador, great habitat hero. Uh, so I hope you can join us and he'll be providing tips on not only what native plants that you can incorporate, kind of some easy areas to think about, uh, but talking about ways to improve the irrigation in your neighborhood 
and even additional measures inside the home, like low flow toilets, uh, taking advantage of rebate programs that different cities uh, offer as well. So kind of a compilation of all those water conservation methods. Next question is from Naomi. Do you know of any bee houses that can be successful? Yes. Hi, Naomi. Thanks for joining us. So bee houses, a few things to think about. If you're wanting to do uh, a kit, uh, a great resource for that is the Bees Waggle. The Bees Waggle. And they have kits that are already assembled that you hang. And a few things to think about when you're putting up a bee house is you want to make sure the wood is untreated. And placement in your yard. The best direction that you can have the holes facing is in the southeast direction. That way inclement weather and our wind isn't coming in and blowing into those holes. So often our north or northeast uh, direction can really influence bees not selecting that place to, to house themselves. Uh, so you want that orientation from the southeast if possible. And we will have our noontime webinar on, I think, June 4th, which will be all about bee construction or uh, bee house construction and placement in your yard as well from one of our community naturalists. We have a few questions about hummingbirds. This one is from Kaylin specifically. I moved to Greeley in 2017 and haven't seen any hummingbirds. Is Greeley part of their habitat? Great question. We love hummingbirds, right? They're like the, the creme de la creme of birds that visit our garden. Uh, hummingbirds tend to prefer the foothills as their ideal range. So even in Fort Collins, we tend to see them on the west side of Fort Collins. And the main ones that we get here in northern Colorado is your broad-tailed hummingbirds. Those are the ones that make the zooming noise that we all get excited about hearing. Uh, and the ruby-throated. Those two we, we, we tend to see quite a, quite a bit of, but again, more on the western side of Fort Collins or I-25 closer to the foothills. Uh, not to say you wouldn't get them in Greeley, but, but they would be less common for sure. Next question is from Myra. Do you have a tip to get a bird bath without the mosquitoes hazard? Ugh. Yes, we get that question a lot. Uh, and the great thing, mosquitoes really need standing water for 72 plus hours uh, with how quickly water evaporates here on the front range. Oftentimes bird baths that just collect natural water rainfall will have evaporated within that 72 hour time frame, so you don't need to worry about breeding mosquitoes. Uh, sometimes people just like to do bird baths in the winter time. A uh, heated bird bath uh, is a great option as well to make sure it doesn't freeze over. And you'll start to see a lot of uh, winter uh, birds that did not migrate uh, joining you in your yard. Next question is from Michelle. I have tried to go rabbit brush by transplanting them that I dig up. This did not work. Now I'm trying to root a clipping. How do I get that going? Can you repeat that, Jen? I'm trying to figure that one out. Sure. Um, it's in the Q&A box. If oh, okay. If you're looking, yes. <laughs> um, I have tried to grow rabbit brush by transplanting them that I dig up. This did not work. Now I'm trying to root a clipping. How do I get that going? I should know this answer because this is how I plant, transplanted my own rabbit brush in the yard. I'm trying to think what we did a couple years ago. Michelle, if you want, if you want to shoot me your email in the chat or Q&A box, and I'll follow up with you separately, kind of on a step-by-step -step instruction, and I'll, I'll see what I can do as far as remembering what we did for our own, and then seeing what else I can do to help you out. So send me your email. In fact, you know what? I will type an answer to you with my email address. And just shoot me a quick email and I'll, I'll try and dig some research up for you if that works. Awesome. We have a question from Eve. Are the requirements to register our yard, are there requirements to register our yards on your website? Yeah, so we have a few different categories of gardens. We have the bronze, the silver, and the gold. 
And we tried to make it easy so you don't have to worry about what category you fit into. You can certainly see the different tiered approach. Uh, and a great example is, you know, someone who would be gold certified might be involved with community science projects. A silver category, they might not be in, they, they aren't doing any community science projects but are interested. Uh, and then a bronze category would be, nope, they're, they don't do any community science projects. Um, and not interested in it. And so we have that broken out for each category. Uh, invasive plants, does uh, your gold garden have 5% invasive plants and your bronze garden have 20% invasive or non-native plants, I should say. Um, so we break it down and we weight each one and then um, we score it out and you'll get graded up, graded. And what we try and do is to make it really positive and offer insight on how to even enhance your landscape or where to go for additional resources to improve it. So you can include that in your application as well. Like I want more mid-story plants, full sun, what would you recommend to improve this landscape? So we can certainly answer your questions that way too. Barb asks, do you have suggestions for flowers that deer are not likely to eat? Deer decimate a lot of flowers in the town that I live in. Oh, the good old question about deer and rabbits. There's certainly no such thing as deer or rabbit proof plants. There are certain plants that do a better job at deterring them. One of my favorite sources is using High Country Gardens. It's an online retailer for plants. And they do denote which plant species do a good job at deterring your uh, rabbits and deer. One thing to note as well is as you overwater your plants, they do have a more fragrant smell to them. They're more sweet and succulent, and that's going to be more attractive for your deer and rabbits. So I encourage you not to overwater them. So do the screwdriver test, hammer, or you know, put your screwdriver in in the soil. If it goes in too easily uh, and it comes out and there's even looks like cake batter soil on your screwdriver, it's way overwatered and that could contribute to the problem of deer and rabbit coming to your yard. Um, and some folks like to have a more formal garden and fence it nice and high, uh, eight, 10 foot fence so the deer or even elk don't jump on in and um, have a garden that way as well. But check out High Country Gardens because they have that little icon that denotes uh, deer and um, rabbit resistant, but it's not really resistant, just deterrent. <laughs> Um, Stacy asks, I know you mentioned the hazards of cats and windows, but are there any plants or trees to avoid that we that would deter birds or make them less hospitable? The main thing would be the location of the plants as far as um, hummingbirds specifically. Some birds are very territorial and they can take over an entire patch. So if you have all of your Hummingbird plants, your red tubular flowers on one side of the house, you're really not going to get a ton of hummingbirds because usually it's the males, one or two males will just keep that territory for themselves. Um, but I can't think of plants that would necessarily deter a bird um, or a hazard for them. Yeah. Jennifer asks, do we need wasp? Are there any suggestions to deter wasp from your yard? We are dealing with that right now. We have a, a wooden deck, part wooden, part track. And I'm not a big fan of using uh, chemicals or, or, or chemicals to deter them. So the best thing that you can do is when you start to see them flying around and you can start to see the little hive that they're creating, the best thing you can do, I know it sounds really mean to knock it down, but just do it right away, right when there's just like one or two openings and um, just knock it down, be consistent, and they'll move on. So we do that weekly, kind of as a perimeter check. We walk around our fence and our deck. And we just kind of look underneath the overhanging ledges. And if we see any of the combs getting made, we just knock them down and it really seems to help. You have to be really vigilant, especially early in the season. Uh, so that's something that we do, like I said, weekly, even twice a week. Um, we normally incorporate that when we go outside into our yard and pick up our, our dog poop. We, we go around and knock down any wasp nests. And it's usually just one or two that we might have to knock down in that week time frame. 
but be vigilant and early on and it, good, good luck. <laughs> the next question is from Caitlin. We had Cooper Hawks nesting close by for the last three years and got to watch them raise their young. They were here briefly a couple of months ago, but seem to have moved on. Do they usually return to the same nesting area? Yeah, they can. So you will either have the same nesting pair come back or it could be, or it could be outcompeted by usually owls will take the spot. Uh, but for the most part, birds are creatures of habit, would like to come back to the same nest and hawks nests and, um, overall are very sturdy. And as long as they didn't get blown down from the wind or another predator didn't, or another um, raptor take it, then, then they will come, come back. In our neighborhood, it, we kind of switch back and forth between Swainson's hawks, red-tailed hawks, and great horned owls. It's one of them, and they keep uh, cycling through in the same nest. Let's do two more questions. Uh, this next question is from Russ. I have a primary focus on water conservation and drought tolerance, which I want to overlap with bird and insect friendly plants. Do you have any suggestions? Let me see. What question? Who is that from Russ? Let's see. Primary yes. focus. So one thing that you could really check out, Russ, is through the city of Greeley to look at their pre-planned gardens. And oftentimes the pre-planned gardens will have an emphasis on either uh, drought tolerant plants or pollinator friendly plants. And I would encourage you to look for a pre-planned garden that hits on both of those notes. So native plants that are low water use and also great for your birds and pollinators. So I would, perhaps Ruth might have some suggestions with the uh, pre-planned gardens that the city of Greeley is offering or through Resource Central. Oh, Ruth, we can't hear you too well. We actually don't produce them. I pay a nonprofit to put them together. So if you go to our website, it'll direct you, redirect you to the Resource Central, and um, you can look there. And there are at least, they offer at least two pollinator gardeners, gardens every year. And yes, and that's what we've used, Russ, is um, Resource Central, and they're, it's called Pollinator Paradise. And that's a nice pre planned garden that has um, native plants, great for pollinators, and then also on uh, use low water as well. Amazing. We'll do one more question. Um, this question is from Whitney. Do you have any budget-friendly suggestions for getting started? Yeah, this is a great question, especially right now. We've been doing some more presentations on budget-friendly and things that you can do from your home. So one tip is planting from seed. So you can get more bang for your buck uh, planting from seed. You'll also have more variety in your native plants. Uh, selection. You can purchase a lot of your uh, seeds online, so online retailers. Doing it yourself and looking at pre-planned gardens, uh, there's a whole array of pre-planned gardens out there, Resource Central, uh, High Country Gardens, Audubon now has some pre-planned gardens, and they all can give you an idea and a sense of what native plants work well in conjunction with other plants. So you could uh, plant the pre-planned garden itself or get ideas or replicate a lot of the gardens so using them as a pattern. Another budget friendly tip is to do it yourself and either rent out machinery if you're say ripping up sod just renting a sod cutter versus um, having contractors come out and doing the work for you. Uh, maybe have a neighbor kid <laughs> help as well. Um, so those are some things using planting from seed doing the stuff, doing all the projects yourself. And then for the design element, instead of hiring a landscape designer, kind of doing some research and seeing not only what native plants work well, but what are some pre-planned garden offerings and how to how do you arrange the, the plants themselves. Perfect, I think that will wrap up our Q&A. Ruth, I don't know if you have any final words that you wanna hop on and say. 
Um, I was just going to say that Plant Select also does, um, some of those plants are native and they also have pre-planned gardens for people. Nice. And what I'll do, I see in one of the other questions regarding the presentation and plant list, I'll send over this presentation as a PDF to Ruth and Jen. They'll send that out to you all and I'll include the plant list and some additional resources and links that we chatted about today. So you have that information. Um, and on kind of just a final closing remark, just remember you are truly what hope looks like to not just birds, but pollinators as well. This is your chance to make a difference in your own community. And we just wanna say thank you, not only for joining us, but for your interest in planting a Habitat Hero Garden. We hope to, to connect with you further. So thank you.